Now it takes us to a slightly uncomfortable realm. But then I am no stranger to speaking uncomfortable truths. So I might as well do my best to make this session as uncomfortable as possible. <laughs> The recent controversy surrounding Pony and Selvan as to whether Cholas were Hindus or not and whether Saiva Siddhanta is part of Hindu fabric or not, we can keep laughing at it because to us it says what nonsense is this. But there was a very clear politico-theological foundation that was laid in this part of the country for this particular kind of politics to find support. Tejasi mentions the period from 1915 to 1925. I would just request you to go back perhaps a century before because the origins of it effectively starts from 1801. So I'll give you just a few timelines. By the time I am done, I will connect the politics of 1801 to the Sabarimala petition of 2016. I will cover everything, what is the nexus between the roots that were laid in 1801 till what happens and what continues to happen in Sabarimala. So 1801, there is a gentleman by the name H.T. Colebrook who comes to this country as part of the gift of Europe, which is colonization. And he effectively says that all languages in this country are to be traceable to Sanskrit. That is the original position of the Christian missionary in this country. Now, which was the first part of Bharat that was effectively colonized? Bengal. So what are the major regions? You have the Bengal presidency, you have the you have the Madras presidency, then you have the Bombay presidency, and then you have Allahabad. That's how exactly these presidency courts were set up. So if you read the politics of Bengal and you read the politics of Madras, you will have a very clear picture of how the missionary movements moved. How is it that every reform movement with respect to Hinduism starts exactly in those places where the British power center is established? And along with that, the missionary comes with him. So by 1801, their position broadly based on the oriental school of thought about Bharatiya philosophy that is set up by missionaries in Bengal is that Sanskrit is the mother of all languages. This is the original position. Subsequently, from around 1830s onwards, Robert Caldwell is a much later phenomenon. He features in the history of this land only around 1856 onwards when he wrote his seminal work, The Comparative Grammar of Dravidian Languages. And by 1881, his work was almost done because by then he had become the bishop of a particular region in this country or in this particular land. And you will perhaps have a very clear picture as to why does the demographic composition reflect a certain way. He became the bishop of Tirunal Valley. So don't be surprised at the demographic composition of that particular part of the country because the investment is not 100 years old. The investment is close to 200 years old in that particular region. So you're not fighting DMK. You're not fighting DK. You're not fighting Justice Party. You're fighting the investment which was much prior to the Justice Party, which was older to the Justice Party by at least a century. At the very least. So prior to him, there were two administrators, Francis Ellis White and another gentleman, Campbell, Alexander Campbell, who come to this part of the country because you see, India was first of all a punishment posting for people in the civil services in England. Because this is a hot country, dirty country, heathens, pagans, idol worshippers, black people. And the punishment posting like Madras on the Adhikmala punishment posting. Because that was seen as Yadanatsani. 
साढ़े सात ही लिटरली ट्रॉपिक ऑफ कैंसर और ऑफ ब्लास्ट फर्नेस लम चुट्टा गा इंगो पाया वन डा वन द वेगर दें सुन ली एंड देवरफॉर सिंस बंगाल प्रेसिडेंसी हैपेंस टू बी द फर्स्ट ब्रश ऑफ द ब्रिटिश कॉलोनाइजर विथ द इंडियन सिविलाइजेशन and since he is not used to the cultural diversity of this land when he comes to madras he thinks that this is so radically different from bengal and therefore he starts assuming look at the difference in physical features look at the difference in script look at the difference in language 100% these are people from a different race that's how their understanding starts because bengal is not what you see as bengal today bengal presidency includes the better part of north india until its uh, its partition in 1905 so they see a certain culture there and madras presidency goes right from the bottom until odisha and they say all these features and the difference in features must be attributed to something very very fundamental and that is a difference in race now you have to realize that simultaneously as they just we pointed out missionaries are trying to find out what is the best way to convert because that's their single point agenda now can we learn sanskrit and somehow establish a similarity between sanskrit and our languages so that we can go after the top order of the society namely the brahmins and then convert the rest of the society once brahmins have been converted they fail to convert and the worst part is they thought we can give them a certain incentive by make, making them a part of the administrative infrastructure teaching them english and what not poor people they didn't realize that these iyers were better at english than them <laughs> there are records which have been captured in a fantastic book that was published in 1969 by an american journalist by the name eugene urshik eu for people who wish to read e u g e n e urshik is i r s c h i k i c k his birthplace was kodaikanal and this fellow captures all the correspondence and the frustration of the british man saying we thought we will teach them they come to the establishment and they're teaching us but since they are so quick at learning you know what we'll have to tolerate them and then gradually we have to start telling them your brains are attributable to the fact that you are somehow related to us so that foundations are gradually laid in the form of a connection between the so called upper classes of this country and the british man in the form of the aryan invasion theory that is slowly pushed now you have to realize there are two or three parallel streams that are going on there is the political stream there is the religious stream how they merge together and then how congress contributes to this problem in 1937 i'll come to it much later i won't take too much time chittu kodi ko necessity kandipa varadu kavaliya padavilla so by i think mid 1850s or 1840s there are two competing schools of missionaries and they are divided one school of mystery effectively says sorry there is a commonality in the entirety of bharat's culture the other effectively says no telugu and tamil don't have sanskrit as their parents and that's how they start putting it out in the politics between two groups of missionaries the second group ultimately wins so it's not as if they're their ideas are the same end goal is the same but they differ on the means the second group says no there is a very clear distinction and they start putting out first is the linguistic separation and then one group starts speaking of the racial separation the genius of robert caldwell was to put together the racial separation and the linguistic separation together to basically say all of this is attributable to the fact that there is actually a religious divide so he brings together the deadly mix of religion race and language and you know how they do that they go back to the one book 
that they were trying to give to us for these justifications, the Bible. So there is a biblical, uh, f- uh, let's say, figure called Noah, who apparently saved the world from the flood, so on and so forth. So Noah has four children, Japhet, Shem, Aram, and Ham. By that time, William Jones, who is credited for revival of Sanskrit in this country, had already taken the position that Sanskrit was the language of three children of Noah, Ham, Japhet, and Aram. Right? Shem. So, the new theory that starts is Tamil and Dravidian languages are the language of Shem. And the Tamil apparently is closer to Old Arabic and Hebrew than to Sanskrit. Imagine this was pushed and this was taken very seriously. By 1856, Caldwell makes this a central document. By 1881, when he has become the Bishop of Tinalveli, what he starts doing is, let me start mapping those parts of the Madras Presidency where there is a lot of competition between communities and see where I can push this most successfully. The training ground and the experimental ground became Tirnalveli. And there he was able to push that entire theory successfully. Now, parallelly what happens is, since you have effectively made the Brahmin the evil creature, his subsistence on the basis of dana from the rest of the communities are taken away. That leaves the Brahmin community with only one option for Sortani. English katan engyad vala pani tole ala. Vera vali illa, enna engyad na saapad varad illa. So they learn English and they join. This fellow treats them as an irritant who has to be employed. And the rest of them see, oh so he's learnt English and he's gone up. And that sense of competition is then exploited for the next hundred years. To effectively say, why should this community alone get English access, why not others? Now then comes the next actor into this entire picture. There starts a fight between the Tamil identity and the Telugu identity. And the demand for a separate Andhra province also starts. So all of us will be fighting. You fight for Telugu, I will fight for Tamil. You fight for Modaliyar, he will fight for Ayur, this fellow will fight for Chettiyar. All of this will go on. The money seems to be coming from some other place. <laughs> swaha, 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 swaha. And somebody is pouring ghee into this fire. All of this goes on until a point where by early 1900s, the language divide, the racial divide, and the religious divide have acquired very serious political overtones. When a societal cord, let's say a societal fissure, becomes so serious for it to find political representation, that means it has achieved mainstreaming. It has become that serious because people are now talking about it at the political discourse. So in the language of 1900s to 1920s, you will see the aryan Dravidian divide. You will see the North Indian-South Indian divide. You will see the Brahmin-Non-Brahmin divide. You will see the Telugu-Andhra divide. All of this playing into the hands of somebody else. And it moves to a point where in 1919, where the Muslims were asking for entrenchment of communal electorates, which is to say separate electoral reservations for Muslims, people from the South were effectively saying, we too want this for a certain set of communities altogether. When that gets rejected, representatives from this part of the country go to London to say, do not give India home rule. And these are representatives of the Justice Party who go to London and specifically plead. Home rule movement is apparently a Brahminical movement because it is led by Annie Besant. Because Annie Besant is one of the founders of the Theosophical Society of India, Vadayar. And she speaks of the greatness of this culture. 
And when she speaks of the greatness of this culture, she's talking about Brahminical culture. So if the British man leaves, the Brahmin will take over. Order. Active representations are made. So did you stop at communal electorates for a particular group of people? No, you didn't stop at that. It came to a point where you're actually looking at crystallization of a real concept called Dravidasthan. Because by then the point that is being made is as long as we are part of Bharat, Tamil Nadu and this particular part of this country will always receive secondary treatment because that victimhood was fed into our minds by the British administrator who didn't want to come here because he thought this was the worst of punishment posting and that was fed further by the missionary. And finally, a resolution is passed in Kanchipuram in 1940 at Justice Party asking for a separate Dravidasthan. Now they thought they would get a brilliant partner in this with Mohammad Ali Jinnah because he was asking for Pakistan. So members of Dravidasthan and members of Pakistan were hand in hand. Is the situation any different today? Find out. Now, Jinnah is not interested in these people. He's like, my people, my people, I don't care for you. As long as I can divide and get my people and I, I can use you to get a separate country for my people, you're useful. When Congress said we are not sitting on the table for any kind of negotiations if Dravidasthan is on the table, Jinnah said, I'm not supporting Dravidasthan anymore. <laughs> so I thought our value would stare. Then what will these Anades do? They have no other option but to continue crying. No, no, Dravidasthan, Dravidasthan, we have to do something about it. So from 1940 until 1963, effectively when, let's say from Justice Party, it is moved to DK, from DK it moves to DMK, and then there's a clear parting of ways in terms of societal initiatives by our Dadi Periyar and by uh, Anna Duray on the other hand, this movement continues. Now, all this while, they dropped two or three goals of the so-called Dravidian movement. The Christian missionary is constantly saying, break the caste structure, it's easy to convert. But a Dravidian movement which is entirely based on caste identity cannot give up caste identity, no? They can only remove it from road names. <laughs> Beyond that, they can't do anything. <laughs> because without that identity, how do we ask for 69% reservation for Tamil Nadu? Very difficult. Right? Over and above the constitutional ceiling of 50%. That is a symbol of Dravidian exceptionalism and entitlement where it believes that the rule that applies to the rest of the country does not apply to this country. So, they effectively start in terms of language imposition, so on and so forth. But the one mistake, and this mistake has to be attributed to the Congress party around that period around 1937 is when there is already an Aryan Dravidian divide, there is already a language divide. They introduce Hindi in schools as a way of education. There can't be a stupider move in the history of this country where you introduce Hindi at a time when that language itself is the subject of a serious problem. When there is already a huge divide. Offering it as an option is one thing, but to treat that as a medium of education at a time when there is already a fire raging here, which is being fueled by outsiders, what kind of Chanakya Niti this was, I have no idea. And this was done by a particular politician who was apparently seen as the Chanakya of his time and who was the Sammandi of Gandhi, Adikmala Nasolla Virumbala. Okay, Adikmala Nasolla Virumbala. I respect him a lot, but this was the case. Okay. Governor, General, Chief Minister and all that later. Because when you are looking at history, we have to be slightly more ruthless in, and objective in our analysis. Our personal likings can go for a hike for a moment because you are talking about the country at the end of the day, you are talking about the civilization. So this is what happened. Now, the next time and the next wave is that they realize that if we actively push for conversions, the, let's say the entire trick book will be open in front of the public. So let's secularize it. 
and we will secularize it in the name of anti brahmanism followed by secular rationality so on and so forth will be actively pushed because i have to protect my caste arithmetic in order for me to come to power so th this goes on then in 1969 a young christian convert lays the foundation for the myth that continues on whatsapp till date he writes an article about how tirukkural was a christian and how he or tiruvallur was a christian and how he was converted 1969 this was written by a guy called devanayagam so he starts the textual evidence parallelly the bishop of mailapur starts looking for archaeological evidence so he pays someone to manufacture and create archaeological evidence that apparently saint thomas visited bharat in 57 ce and that myth is given a, a certain degree of support by 1975 as part of these efforts one bishop pulls out a stone from a place called nilakkal which is supposed to be the playground of swami ayappa in sabarimala and he says this is the cross that was planted by saint thomas at sabarimala this is 1975 Sabrimala ayappa devotees said nothing doing we'll come up in black shirts and the karpu satte in the karpu satte vela pannum dk oda karpu ku ayappa oda karpu dhaan badhil i say this because that is one temple where all so called caste differences merge and die you don't know how to respect a woman here's a brahmachari you don't know how to talk about women here's a brahmachari who knows what is celibacy he has control over his tongue when he speaks about women or he who, when he is in their presence that's the difference so 1975 this happens before that in 1950s the sabarimala temple is broken into and the murti is hacked into pieces now who has the incentive i will not answer that question and the temple is set on fire because you see this is a mala temple and apart from that since he is a yogi who is in who is a naishtika brahmachari it is not a temple that is supposed to be kept open year round and therefore what happens is the guardians of the temple so on and so forth they also leave the temple and they come down from the hill so at the kaakaradhukku eppome yarum and the time la kadaiyadu so burn the place and hack the murti into pieces so what started in 1950s then there is an attempt in 1975 read a few newspapers to what happened around the latest round of sabarimala agitation in terms of the controversy surrounding nilakkal again where cross plantation started once more in nilakkal this is not new this is the commitment where one failure doesn't result in silence it results only in temporary silence and then they wait for the right opportunity because all this while simultaneously the hindu society is being constantly deracinated thanks to its education in english so you will wait when the society itself is ready to spew and spit on its own culture and then you reclaim the place the latest round with respect to sabrimala i don't know how many people have been reading this is if the male shanti of sabrimala can come only from a set of families that's the latest question and the weapon that will be wielded once more whose value and whose consequences i will leave it to the audience to judge is the weapon called equality now this is the broad setup or the broad framework of the dravidianist cancer please address these problems immediately it is no more in the realm of just pop culture it is going to affect you in every way possible the one part of this great nation or this great civilization that has managed to preserve its temples despite the ravages of time and history and 1200 years of barbarism is under a different kind of insidious attack 
it is for us to say, okay, we'll keep fighting amongst ourselves. Our differences will continue. But no outsider will at least get the right to speak on the table when we are speaking. The ideal goal would be to somehow find a way to submerge these differences, but that's a long-term process. But at the very least, in the interest of survival, do not let an outsider partake in these discussions. Politically, socially, culturally, they have no business talking to us or about us on these issues. That is the one thing that I hope we go back with in the form of a sankalpam. That's all I have to say. Namaste. Vande Matram Jai.